I am the chair of the Department of Global Health and the director of the Arnold Institute for Global Health at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. We have been hosting our webinar series on COVID and global health for over a year now, and I'm really excited to revisit a topic that we discussed um, almost a year ago, uh, thinking about global mental health and particularly mental health globally in the COVID pandemic currently, and thinking about how this has evolved and the ongoing state of, of global mental health is, is going to be our focus today. Of course, um, this is the month where we celebrate and draw awareness to and honor and try to really consider more deeply issues of mental health for, for May and Mental Health Awareness Month. And I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Pamela Collins, to you for this discussion. First, um, just a note, let me say for people joining us, um, we will have some time where we would love to try to take some questions um, from those joining us in the end. There is a chat box that you in a Q&A box, you can enter your questions into the Q&A box and we will um, try to talk to some of those uh, when we get to the towards the end of the hour, but please feel free to type them in at any time and then we'll look at those. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Pamela Collins. So Dr. Collins is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and a professor of global health at the University of Washington. She is also the executive director of ITEC, which stands for the International Training and Education Center for Health, which is an enormous uh, global health uh, endeavor that operates um, offices with more than 2000 staff globally providing technical assistance Systems, health system strengthening, and a, a range of global health activities uh, around the world. She um, also leads the University of Washington's Global Mental Health Program, and I'm particularly excited to talk with her about aspects of their work in that fashion today. Before be, her, her positions at the University of Washington, Dr. Collins was the director of the Office for Research on Disparities and Global Mental Health and the Office of Rural Mental Health Research at the National Institutes of Mental Health at the National Institutes for Health, the NIH. She has led and launched research initiatives that extend mental health services all around the world from Africa to Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. She's also led research to reduce mental health disparities among diverse racial and ethnic groups, um, as well as indigenous communities within the United States. And I would, I think, almost be hard pressed to find, uh, in many ways, like uh, uh, an organization in global health with which she has not partnered or worked or consulted. She's had roles um, and collaborations with the World Bank, the World Health Organization, um, the UN's Joint Programs on AIDS, the US Department of State. Um, um, and so on. She was a commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. And I particularly um, have followed her work closely um, because her research has really paved the way for those of us who want to consider the intersections of mental health and HIV care in particular, both in the United States and in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the specific mental health needs of adolescents in a global context. So, um, I, I guess further introduction, Dr. Collins uh, did her undergraduate studies at Purdue University. She did her medical degree and training at Cornell University's Medical College. She has a master's of public health from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Her residency training in psychiatry was also done at Columbia as well as postdoctoral fellowship training at both Columbia University and Harvard Medical School. So, Welcome, Dr. Collins. Thank you so much for the privilege of, of your time with us and sharing your, your expertise with us today. Um, you know, I have long appreciated the work that you've done to really shift the paradigm of how mental health challenges are considered and treated within global health, and especially how health systems might more holistically address mental health issues, including within the, the context globally of the, the 
HIV epidemic. So I really appreciate in this way, in so many ways, you know, through your work at the NIH and your, your ongoing leadership in global health, how you've made it possible for people like me and, and our collaborators and people I've worked with in Kenya for years to dive into what it means to support families in this more holistic way around both their mental health, their physical health needs, living with HIV, and some of the long-term challenges that come with that. So thank you so much. I know it's a lot of introduction, but I have nothing but glowing words and appreciation for your, your time together today. So we find ourselves, of course, um, at this point where we are more than a year into this global COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and of course, the circumstances of the pandemic continue to shift both around those of us who are in the United States, as well as um, our colleagues, friends, and family living in other parts of the world. And of course, um, we've seen and I think increasingly heard about how the circumstances of the pandemic have been both causing and exacerbating mental health issues, and also, of course, compromising uh, the ways that we gain access to care, whether for mental health or for other conditions. And I think that's especially been true, of course, for communities and population groups where there already are inadequate access to services in, in place. Um, whether those are minority populations, individuals in remote or underserved areas, rural areas, and so on. So given this, I'd like to start a bit from the, the big picture of where we find ourselves right now. And I wondered, as you look at this big picture, and as we think about global mental health, where we are at this point in 2021, what do you consider as the like big three challenges facing us right now? So first, thank you, Dr. Riemann, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I, I really appreciate it. And um, you've posed a really big question. I know. <laughs> Sorry. Top <laughs> <Stop> at three. <laughs> so, I, so I'm going to think big picture and mm -hmm. want to talk about, I think, this moment as an opportunity to think about what we would like to see the future bring, mm -hmm. um, but also letting this moment inform some of the current needs that communities are facing around the world. And I would say that number one, people in the global mental health community have been saying this for a while. I think the voice around this particular issue has gotten stronger and stronger, but the pandemic has really brought this into focus for us in a way that nothing has, I think, recently. And that is that one of our first priorities and one of our biggest challenges is going to be to respond to social inequities as drivers of poor health outcomes, including mental health. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, to, to make that even more specific, certainly with the experiences we've had in the United States, but not just in the United States and many countries of the world, we need to recognize and respond to racism in all of its forms and discrimination in all of its forms as a threat to health and well being across the lifespan. And some sectors have just begun to acknowledge that systems of racism or considerations of caste are woven into the fabric of our societies. And these govern access to everything from safety from violence, quality health care, education, livelihoods, and income and a host of resources that literally determine how and when and whether we live or die. Mm -hmm. But none of this is new. I mean, we've known this. But negotiating these threats to our survival that inequality and unfairness yield or simply being exposed to them on an ongoing basis assaults the health, the well-being, and life trajectories of communities and individuals. And on the other hand, what we can also think about and have to think about are that there are social drivers that protect the overall health and well-being of communities. And those are things that, again, are these are not new issues, but early childhood interventions, quality education, anti-discrimination laws and policies, safe and affordable housing, employment opportunities, access to quality health services. These are all foundational to our mental health. And I think we, we need to keep reminding ourselves of this. I think this is also a moment that the global mental health community can think about its advocacy beyond mental health and beyond health. I think that's one of the messages 
of the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development, that globally, we can, how do we stimulate and accelerate efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals, right? And that's, it's such an extraordinary vision, right? This vision of a world that can eradicate poverty, that can respect human rights, that can leave no one behind. And with this agenda, there is an implicit recognition of the danger to dignity, health, and well being that comes from inequality based on race, based on ethnicity, gender inequality, or any other human characteristic, including ability. So pushing for SDG 10, um, which is trying to reduce inequality that's, that includes poverty, but that also includes personal experiences of discrimination and structural discrimination. I think these are targets that our global mental health community should also be um, advocating for. So I would say number two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's long number one. <laughs> yes, and it's, it's a it's a big one and such an important one. We could probably talk for the whole hour about about that, and maybe we will. But yes, okay. But number two. <laughs> so number two, I think in tandem with this greater attention to social determinants of health, we really need access now to equitable, quality, affordable mental health care and to primary care. Um, and the pandemic has shown us again that health disparities are simply amplified in a crisis. We know that in an emergency, people who are particularly vulnerable mm -hmm. experience greater morbid morbidity and mortality. And so our responses should anticipate this. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to anticipate this. Um, I think you and others have probably seen the study that Wong and colleagues conducted from electronic medical data of more than 61 million patients in the United States who had a recent diagnosis of mental illness and that these folks had a much greater odds of contracting COVID and people with a recent diagnosis of depression and schizophrenia had more than seven times the odds of people without a mental illness of being infected with COVID-19 and had higher rates of hospitalization as well as death. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other interesting thing that we can talk about a little bit later is that in addition to this disparity between people with a mental illness and not in the context of the healthcare system, um, the racial disparities were also apparent in this population such that people that, that you know, for African-Americans, there was a threefold greater odds of infection than for whites, which is what we've seen um, across the country more generally. So I think the, the great thing about the pandemic is that we've seen this amazing acceleration of um, an expansion of digital access, mHealth, telehealth services, hotlines all over the world. This has not only been in, in high income countries. There's so many wonderful examples, but we need this kind of commitment to persist within the health system specifically. And we need to ensure that the, the health systems going forward are able to integrate mental health care along with chronic disease care, whether that's infectious or, or, or non-communicable, and really give the parity between mental health and other medical conditions. This is a tremendous challenge that remains. Uh, I think another, uh, another area of advocacy for us as a mental health community is this keeping our voices loud as the world journeys to universal health coverage, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that while we are talking about this, that mental health is given its proper space in universal health coverage. Um, and if, if there's nothing else, this pandemic has shown us that we can't, we can't talk about, there's no conversation about mental health and physical health. We have to talk about health. <laughs> these, these, these go hand in hand. The relationships are inseparable. Um, injuries to our health have mental health consequences and poor mental health increases the chances of other poor health outcomes. So we have to bring these together and we have to advocate for access to care for our mental health and for all of our health. I would say that number three, if I have to choose, you're making it very hard. <laughs> um, I suppose we could do four, but. You know. <laughs> I would say three is um, we have to attend to the mental health needs of children, adolescents, and youth. And I, and I say that that was always true, but I think the pandemic has also shown us how this incredible time of isolation, of absence from school, of people being in homes that are not necessarily safe for them, of 
uh, watching parents struggle of financial challenges, all of this, this devastation of isolation um, and seeing these, this, the same impacts occur along lines of social disadvantage, of economic instability, forces us to think more broadly about, I think it gives us an opportunity to say, what is pandemic preparedness and what is pandemic recovery and what should those entail for children and youth? And I think that means that when we think about pandemic preparedness, because this will happen again, other disasters will happen, this should include strengthening child protection mm. and developing strategies to elim eliminate childhood abuse. We need to be doing that in the in now and in the interim. We need to increase access to early childhood programs. We need to think more creatively about schooling. What happens to schooling when you can't get to a physical school? Um, how, do we, how do we better respond to that? We need to think about family supports. How do we support the ability of parents to provide nurturing care even when there are tremendous shocks? How do we enable them to be skilled parents at different stages of development, even in the context of terrible shocks? and to be able to work. And I would say the other thing we need to do is provide access to mental health care for parents who need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so attending to the needs of children and adolescents and youth, which includes their families <laughs> and creating communities around them that can support them, um, ensuring that all of us, everyone can get real access to mental health care now um, and ensuring that we address those big issues, those big social drivers that have, um, that are killing us <laughs> and that need to be, that need to be taken very as seriously as we take um, access to a doctor, right? Those have to be taken equally as seriously or perhaps more seriously. So that's where I would go with my big three for now. Well, I think those are, yeah, a tremendous big three to start with, you know, and across that I'm, I'm struck by what it really means to move forward, I guess, universal health in a way, in, in terms of what you're talking about, not just, of course, access to services universally and, and including in that, you know, whether you include ideally, of course, kind of the, what we've tended to call health, but often are just thinking of very specific physical health needs and mental health needs, but also this much more holistic type of universal health that addresses the needs of the family, the ability to access school, to be protected in the home environment. And then of course, these incredible forces of social determinants and the systematic forces, often systematic inequalities, racism, things operating at, at multiple levels that are also dismantling or harming health in this way. So I, I think it's an incredible vision of holistic health that you that you paint forward that way. Um, you know, I'm I I know that you collaborate and work with people and institutions and networks across quite a broad global um, platform. And as you, you know, think about these big forces that are at play, um, and I, I would say too, you know, I, I think even in everything that you bring up, we, we have seen in the pandemic how the vulnerabilities, the inequities in our systems that are there are just made even more clear in this time of intense stress with, with the pandemic, whether that's, you know, who has access to, you know, the resources to provide a safe place for their family and children to stay and, and to maintain ongoing virtual education versus, you know, who um, needs to, uh, you know, who's able to access even, you know, testing for COVID or, of course, we're seeing this more and more with vaccines and different things in terms of specific systems. But I would, I would be curious um, to hear from your perspective, looking across your global network in, in, ITEP, in ITEC, how you've seen some of your partners and the work that you have going on evolve over this year in terms of what you're able to, whether support within the health systems, what things have been you know, more and more coming to the, the forefront, where you see bigger gaps emerging is how broadly you've, you know, you've seen the work evolving over this last year. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, and I would say it's there, it's really varied. You know, we just had a call on Monday with our network leads and we left 
a great amount of time for Dr. Anwar Parva Syed, who's the director of iTech India, to talk because you know he's a physician. He's been leading a lot of work supporting HIV care treatment, the implementation of um, you know of, of sharing and PEPFAR implementation in in India, mm -hmm. but has stepped into the role of a COVID doc now, right? In the midst of this awful, awful, awful crisis in India. So this journey over this last year has, been, has not been a steady one, right? It's been full of bumps. And, and right now this, this wave of infections and death in India is one that is really difficult um, to even wrap, wrap one's mind around. And, but I think we've had a chance to hear from someone working on the front lines with that. And, and I think hearing from, he wrote a wonderful op-ed actually that's, that um, is available online, but hearing from, hearing both the, the sadness, but also the frustration. Mm -hmm. And again, the same message that we have to strengthen our health system so that we don't get caught in this kind of a situation again is, is something that, that I think he would say very strongly. So that's one experience. Um, I, th across the iTech network, I've been really impressed at how people have managed to figure out how to do what they need to do remotely, those who are able to um, manage the anxieties I think that the entire world was feeling at the beginning around the epidemic and what it would mean for each person's safety, what it would mean for people's mobility and for the frontline workers that we work with. Um, real anxieties about their own personal safety as well as the safety of their families, right? How do you keep your family safe when you're going to, when you're treating patients every day? So I feel like that was, we were hearing that at the beginning a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and then people got very innovative, right? So how do, we, how do we do what we do remotely? How do we train health workers remotely? What are the different platforms that can be used in different contexts? So I would say that it's been this, just like we've experienced here in the United States, right? These, you know, the big wave, a little bit of what seems like some kind of stability, but all at the same time feeling a, 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 the pervasive sense of weirdness <laughs> that, <laughs> that this is not normal. And how do, we, how do we manage to do the best that we can to keep the services that we need to provide going during a time of, of incredible abnormality? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what people miss a lot is simply actually not being able to share experience with one, one another face to face, right? Because mm -hmm. we only really experience and share those things differently um, when we're able to actually see our colleagues and be with our colleagues and they with us than we can do over Zoom. Absolutely. Yeah, and I certainly, certainly feel that as well. You know, it's, I'm, um, you know, my background um, as a pediatrician who's done HIV related work now primarily in East Africa for the last almost 20 years, it has been, um, it has, you know, it is it, what in terms of what you're saying in terms of the pivots for, you know, we've got had many years of experience and worked with a lot of partners around what it looks like to scale up a health system to provide care for HIV and increasingly, you know, uh, in you know, thankfully, in my experience of that, it was really at the even at the earliest stage, the point of we had medicines accessible and how do we build a system that can provide treatment over the long term, but kind of moving out of that emergency phase and into this treatment phase. And, you know, even within the challenge of HIV, I think those of us you know, doing that work have certainly wrestled with the incredible burden of, you know, what has continued to be, you know, almost 1 million people a year lost to HIV and the, the ongoing tragedy of that. And yet, as many of us have found ourselves now, you know, pivoting into this new pandemic, there is such a different, um, I don't know, a different st stress almost fits like the wrong word, but a different stress and weight to, the unknown of this new virus and the ways in which it has, we've seen it sort of crumbling our health systems and, and having such, you know, immediate impact or, around us and what it looks like to, well, certainly people I think are applying, of course, many of the lessons learned from things like HIV and of course to the, this new challenge and yet um, it just puts such a stress on the system. And then at the same time, just as you're saying, not to have the same kinds of, 
interpersonal, you know, in interactions with that, that, that do, I think, give us so much strength in this um, over the, the long term, even, even where, you know, you have relationships in place. And yes, we're maintaining lots of our work remotely and things are moving forward. But, but um, this is the point, I think, where so many are really feeling that absence of being able to, you know, connect with colleagues, especially in things that are so difficult right now as well. I should note we can um, will when we we do um, for everyone listening we do you know we usually post these um, recordings from the webinar within 24 hours or so and we can absolutely put um, a link to the the op-ed um, that Dr. Collins referred to in in there as well to to share that perspective um, as we go. You know, I wanted you. You talked about this some, but I would like to dig in a little bit more in terms of thinking about the intersecting structural forces that we really um, see, and and I think have seen more clearly at play during the this pandemic year. Um, certainly, things that we've been aware of all along that have absolutely been at at play for centuries um, in terms of systemic racism, police violence, even, even um, factors like HIV as well, all of which um, we've, we've talked about in this webinar series in different ways before. And I like to return to, especially because we do see for all of these very disproportionate um, and often intentionally disproportionate or discriminatory impacts on people of color. And I, I wanted to ask you to, um, it, you know, to whatever extent you're willing to, to share with us a bit about how you see structural racism, both creating and perpetuating mental health disparities, um, and maybe broadly, and then also, of course, you know, within the, the pandemic this year, but, but I think as a general um, uh, phenomenon, <laughs> to call it, if, if you could talk about that a little bit, it would be I think really helpful for the, the listeners here. Yeah, and I'll take one step back just to sure. say, give, give a little um, sense of definition, right, around mm -hmm. when we talk about racism. And I love the work that David Williams does and explains around this, that systems of racism, of course, are those that promote ideas of inferior inferiority of a specific population. And they not just promote those ideas, but they entrench them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they entrench these ideas into belief systems and into norms of the larger culture. And they allow then the legitimacy of mm -hmm. discrimination that marginalize and devalue groups of people. And of course, we can see this not only according to race, but according to many kinds of discrimination. But with racism, these effects are pervasive and they support other mechanisms that that keep them going, that perpetuate them. Those include implicit and explicit bias. Um, and this really leads people to react negatively to people who are stigmatized. Um, but it also influences whether or not people decide to support laws that actually would make things more egalitarian. I, I think that's a really important piece of this, right? We, when you devalue people, um, that means the protections for them become less important, mm -hmm. right? And that's an important part of, of, of structural racism. So institutional or structural racism then support policies that essentially sustain unfair allocation of resources and reduce access to opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that can be through segregation, that can be sometimes through forced migration or simply through removal of people from their properties, lands, whatever belongs to them. So then discrimination becomes the individual behavior by which people's access to economic, educational, medical, or other social resources are limited. And so the consequences are many, right? The consequences include reduced life chances, um, Overall, they include psychological distress, they include mood anxiety symptoms, they include an increased risk of mental disorders, and they include precursors to chronic medical conditions. Um, so these are issues that should be part and parcel again of what the mental health community and what the global health community writ large also challenges and, 
and looks to determine how to dismantle right both these individual forms of racism as well as structural racism i think one good example and i'll i'll talk about this again recognizing that i don't think we can i don't think we can really parse the difference between things that affect our 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 physical health and our mental health right so so even this these the the struggle in this country around wearing masks around acknowledging covid I think when we recognize that in this country, people of color were so disproportionately affected by that, the insensitivity to addressing COVID mm -hmm. is racist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, the, and, and I think even in our very hospitals, right? In our very hospitals, when we look at who in the hospital is getting infected, who in the hospital has died, who in our teams in the you know in New York City, mm -hmm. um, we clearly see these. We clearly see this racial disparity. We see this mm -hmm. this inequity, um, and and that has that has mental health effects on on the entire community, right? On the entire community of people that are affected by these this these kinds of stressors, right? Both the stressor, the very real stressor of being infected. But then the larger pervasive stressor of recognizing that there is a system that actually is not operating in your favor, right. and um, and it's unclear who is aware of that and what they may be doing to protect you, mm -hmm. and that's a, that has a tremendous impact on on people's mental health. And that and I'm and I'm talking from experience in a high income country. Mm -hmm. And I think when we move that to other settings where people that are at risk of marginalization, discrimination, mm -hmm. because of their ethnicity, because of their caste, because of their religious uh, practices, whatever it may be, and who have fewer resources um, to defend against the, these kinds of, um, to defend against the, the impact of this discrimination, then of course, one would expect to see obviously poorer, poorer outcomes. Um, so does that answer your question? I have to remember. It does. No, thank you. I was just thinking this was, um, uh, that was such a great teaching truly about, you know, walking through what structural racism really looks like and the broad impact of it with that. So thank you for, for that. I think that's, um, it was a, it was a better answer to, <laughs> to the question than, than what we could have done. I, you know, and I guess, you know, thinking of, and I, I really appreciated the, the way that you, you know, described it in the different facets, how entrenched um, and, and, and then how kind of built into the system, these, these inequities and the, the racism, the discrimination, the taking away, or, you know, ensuring that goods of all kinds, including health, are, are essentially with, withheld from the group that's being discriminated against in that. I guess if we were to flip this, in a, in, if we had a magic wand or, or something better than that even, um, you know, what, what would it look like to really scale up systems that we're doing the opposite. Like, well, I guess what things that are entrenched in that, you know, particularly need to be broken down or what would it look like to really be able, I mean, you know, I think it's one thing to say, like, how do we globally, you know, build health systems that could provide adequate care for mental health needs or truly like holistic health, health needs in this. But a, a portion of that I think becomes how do we, how do we break down these incredibly entrenched systematic, ways in which inequality, inequity, racism are are built into to our systems. Do you have any ideas for that or maybe even just like your dream of what this would look like if we if we built something better? Yeah, I mean, I think that has to happen at so many levels, right? There mm -hmm. there is the level of there is legislation, there right? There is actually let's let's think about our population wherever mm -hmm. in the world one may be and let's think about the population needs and where 
we see disparities, we have to scratch our heads <laughs> and not just say that, oh, well, we expect those because blah, blah, blah. We have to scratch our heads and see, well, what, what kind of policies might we need to enact in order to help to redress those, those disparities? So I think that's at the, at the top level. Yeah. At the other level, I think there's actually this real engagement with communities, right? So really going to people who are using services, who need care, <laughs> who are experiencing challenges in getting care and, and working from there to say, how do we design a system that works for you? So engaging communities, I mean, we've been talking about this a lot, of course, also with end users of mental health services saying, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that people who use mental health services are at the center of the way that we design those services, mm -hmm. thereby at the center of the way that we actually study those services and the way that we design our interventions, how do we make sure that the end users are there from the beginning. And I, I think that's true with trying to scale up a system is first saying, um, do we, have we got all of the ingredients that we need, first of all, to, to optimize whatever it is we wanna do to optimize the intervention? Or do we have the end users of the intervention adequately engaged to ensure that the intervention is, is right <laughs> and how it needs to be tweaked? Um, but then we and we have a tremendous role here for implementation science, right? So if if we had, I think one of the things that most of us in the mental health community would say is that we always need more resources. We we but if you said we can wave a magic wand and we have an adequate number of resources, I think we still need to understand how to take what we know works, mm -hmm. how to bring the voices of those end users to help us make those tweaks to optimize it for a diverse set of contexts where we have to scale up services so that we can then determine what are the best models to implement whatever it may be in rural Washington state, in mm -hmm. urban Dar es Salaam, in peri-urban Buenos Aires, you know, what, is, what does that look like? And that's gonna be complicated and um, quite different in different health systems, but I think this is what implementation science does. So I, so I, I think there's a real role for implementation science to help us better understand how to do this. And then there's a there's an understanding that once you implement things, it's not, it's not like a wind up toy. It doesn't keep going. We have to we have to keep feeding improvement into the system, right? And what are the best methods of feeding that quality improvement into the system, mm -hmm. of ensuring that people. Uh, stay motivated to achieve the outcomes they need to achieve, assuring that the, the people that are using those systems stay engaged and are able to have a voice that an, allows them to continue to uh, co-design improvements in that system. I think those are the kinds of things that would be in place in order for us to see a successful scaling up. I mean, that's a simplified answer, but I think those are some of the ingredients. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting, the ingredients that you're talking about in that really resonate with um, discussions we've been having, especially over this year in our Arnold Institute for Global Health of what it looks like to support and and build global partnerships that could make just that kind of change possible with where, you know, how can you really start with, you know, input and the specific priorities and voices of the community of the people that you're you know as you said the end users of of those you are trying to you know be engaged with and serve and and address health needs then of course also this question of kind of what works you know how do you how do you take and understand what what solutions are are actually going to you know make a difference in these things but then there's this special uh, you know, I think of it as this this kind of set of key partners that you bring together to create those components where you need long term relationships, you know, among health systems, academic partners, government partners in, you know, to, if, if you want to really, you know, not only have ideas for what works and, and sense of that, but to then really move it forward and then somehow create this think of it as like this learning environment, as you were saying, but where you are having quality improvement, potentially readjusting, continuing to go back to the community, figuring out what's working and where things are, are moving forward. And I think it's so easy for us, you know, whether it's those of us in a particular part of academia or researchers or even clinicians, you know, in our kind of siloed areas to think like, okay, well, we're doing this piece. And yes, like we need to do these pieces 
well, but but to figure out mechanisms that do kind of fit to put, I don't know, that whole set of, of players in, in place in a way that can really move work forward in, in that way. That it's not just a resource you know, need that, that you have to have these relationships and the right structures in place. Um, you know, from both, I mean, even at an individual level, but all the way up to, you know, government levels and global collaboration around, around things in that. And that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about stigma with you a bit in part because I, I, you know, I know, I guess selfishly that you've done a great deal of work in this area. I'd say selfishly, because I would be delighted to talk about stigma all day and in, in some ways. And um, in my own work in um, HIV, I have felt like it has been a continual learning process every year of the extent to which stigma has even more impact and even more, um, you know, of a role uh, for the health of children and their families and, and adults, of course, too. Um, that I've realized that I'm just like, every year I'm just learning more about the ways in which stigma is impacting all the things that we want to try to do to Im improve health. Um, and, you know, I, I, I come less from the mental health space, more from pediatrics and, and HIV space. And I, I wondered if you could talk about um, mental stigma related to mental illness and, and mental health challenges. In particular, you know, I, I, it has seemed over this last year, like there have been a lot of public discussions about mental health as people have been considering, you know, the various impacts of the pandemic of having people shelter in place at home, the isolation and so on. And I wondered if, if you have seen any, have any sense of whether, you know, we are moving in a good direction um, for, you know, having less stigma related to mental health concerns or, um, perhaps we're, you know, in the most beginning <laughs> part of this. And, and of course, with that, you know, to anything you want to share about ways that we can, we can think of both as individuals, institutions trying to reduce stigma further as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I you know, this is all, this is anecdotal in, in terms of looking at the last few months, but I would, so I would say yes and no. I'm really grateful that the media is talking about mental health mm -hmm. and the mental health effects of COVID. I think we see that a lot. And I, and I do think that that contributes to normalizing appropriate distress mm -hmm. and also encouraging people to seek help. Sure. So I think people are more likely to acknowledge that, yeah, something's not right. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps talk to, even talking to a friend about that, which may have been something that people didn't do before. I think people are talking to their coworkers more about these things, which probably didn't happen before as much in some places. And in, in, in the Lancet Commission on Mental Health and Sustainable Development, we talked about mental health status as a continuum from well-being and the absence of distress all the way to severe and persistent symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was to emphasize that everyone falls somewhere along this continuum mm -hmm. at every day of their lives. We all fit on this continuum somewhere. And during COVID, I think a great number of people moved from that well-being state to non-specific distress mm -hmm. and even into um, kind of subclinical areas. And then of course, also into what we would consider a clinical syndrome for which you might go and seek care. Mm -hmm. And that, simply, you know, we, we were reading, certainly the first reports all came from healthcare workers, right? And healthcare workers experienced tremendous stress, trauma. Uh, and, and I think this wonderful response in many institutions, and I think this is true around the world as well, this is certainly true in my institution at University of Washington, with people first figuring out how, how do we respond to the needs of frontline health workers and normalize that experience of, of mental distress, even to mental illness, how do we respond to these folks who are putting their lives on the line every day? So I, I think in that context, there probably has been some reduction of stigma. On the other hand, um, I don't really know. <laughs> you know, um, I think we've tried to res be responsive and tried to make services available, um, but I suspect that still 
depending on how you think about mental illness and what's available in your context, the stigma really varies. You know, I, I think a lot of us have talked about for some time that part of what drives stigma related to mental illnesses are, is, and this is true, of, actually, this was true of HIV too, right? When people don't see that there's any kind of treatment, right? They see these conditions as something that can't be, can't be dealt with. Mm-hmm. Um, and for people with severe mental illnesses, and in places where they don't have access to care, and even in places where they do have access to care, I think that perception may persist, and that probably persists in the context of COVID. If you have been identified as somebody with this with a severe and persistent mental illness, perhaps. Um, I think the other thing that contributes to stigma is our horrible treatment conditions, right? So people that, you know, if your option for seeking care is to go to an institution that is um, does not provide quality of care that, that is known for human rights abuses, that contributes to stigmatizing the condition as well as the people that work there. Um, and I think that probably intensified in the context of COVID because I would imagine, I know I've, I've heard stories in different places about people simply being afraid to go to hospitals in general and particularly afraid to go to a psychiatric hospital for fear of infection with COVID, um, in addition to the already uh, negative uh, ideas that people and feelings people have against uh, toward going to psychiatric institutions more generally. So so I would say there's probably a yes and a no that for the the general population that's been experiencing distress and um, more moderate, mild to moderate symptoms, maybe we are having more of a conversation. Mm -hmm. But for people who are needing care consistently and the institutions and uh, sources that are available have not are not optimal maybe maybe no I'll, I'll say one thing just as a one of the really interesting um, and exciting opportunities I had during this time of COVID was to serve as an advisor for a series that will be airing soon that Oprah and Prince Harry produced around mental health um, mm-hmm called The Me You Can't See, mm-hmm. which really, I, I think the timing of it turned out to be wonderful. Obviously, nobody knew there was going to be a pandemic when they planned this, but the timing turned out to be great in that they have had a conversation with people living with different, many different kinds of mental health conditions, mm-hmm. talking about those, and I think just emphasizing um, the shared need for connection that everyone has felt during this pandemic. Mm-hmm. So I think that is probably true that everyone has experienced isolation. Everyone has been able to talk about isolation, perhaps loneliness, and to some degree to talk about aspects of their mental health. Mm-hmm. There's a question, actually, let me just um, say to the group of those listening, please feel free to put some questions into the, the box, some additional questions. We can we can try to answer a few of those. But there, there's a question that um, I think relates into what you were just talking about that I, that I raised that was in the chat asking, how do you break the stigma, particularly for the Black community? How do you get more resources in marginalized communities? It sounds like you've been engaged with um, one one such option for trying to move that discussion further. Um, But I wondered if you had any comments for that, Dr. Collins. Yeah, I I think, again, one of one of the ways that you do that is to talk to people. I mean, I I sit here in Seattle, I sit on our, I I join people in our, we have an African-American health board that is focused on many aspects of health. But I think most people, and in the last year actually has been doing some work around mental health actually preceding COVID. Um, And I think what most people want are, first of all, conversations that acknowledge what they feel are drivers of poor mental health, right? So, and often that doesn't happen when you seek care, you know, it, it, you know it, and this, this, I think this manifests many ways globally where there's a mismatch between what the provider sees as the cause of the problem and what the person sees as the cause of the problem. And that itself determines where you go for help, right? Sure. So if you see that the big driver of your problems with your, with your mental health have to do with experiencing um, discrimination in your workplace, mm-hmm. you know, is that really something that a psychiatrist is going to manage or, a, or a, any kind of therapist? Or who do you go to for that? 
Similarly, if you see that the big driver is that your, um, your husband is unemployed and is not able to get work for however much time, wherever you live in the world, and that's causing stress in the family and that's causing depression and anxiety, do you really, do people actually see those as things that they should go to a, to a mental health care provider for? So I think part of this is being able to have conversations and being able to understand what people experience as drivers of their poor mental health and then working with communities to figure out, okay, well, what, what, what is that toolkit <laughs> that's available of resources that are available. Some of that may include actually getting care and having some kind of treatment intervention. Some of that may include figuring out how the resources that are in your community can best support you. Mm -hmm. Some of that may include figuring out how your own involvement in larger efforts around advocacy mm -hmm. may be good for your mental health, right? May be empowering and be able to, to um, and, and also help to solve some of those bigger, bigger questions. So I, I think it, it requires actually recognizing that we have to, um, we have to get out and listen to people. Mm -hmm. I and, think that that's such a, yeah, you've laid out such a critical part of the, the challenge and of the spectrum. You know, I, I would start by thinking like here, you might have this you know, physician sitting here thinking about neurotransmitters and what's, you know, you know, what medicine would fix this or this or that and a patient particular potentially sitting there thinking about, you know, I'm worried that the police are going to kill my son or these things in this, this mismatch between not and not, of course, that they can't come together. And I think that's why what you're saying about conversation is so critical and thinking about that spectrum of resources, but that if we stay in our paradigms of, you know, neurotransmitters versus significant community trauma, that's, you know, something you're, you're dealing with every, you know, every day, that's, it's, it's just a, a place where, where you can't find those ways that, you know, maybe it is the, the shared community effort here, maybe it's this protest, maybe it's action at a policy level, maybe it is medication, but this whole spectrum of options that way. Yeah, and I think it means just be, you know, that, that everyone has to be a little bit more porous, right? Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to be willing to, to, to somehow, um, to provide a bridge so that, people can have those conversations and recognize that, oh, actually there can be multiple things that I need mm -hmm. and multiple interventions might be necessary here and, and, and we have to work it out together. Well, we have lots of big and great questions coming in for you. <laughs> um, here's one to start with related to financing actually. Um, so lack of public financing is a huge bottleneck, certainly for mental health care equity. What do you see as some of the biggest opportunities to expand financing for mental health services at the state, national, or, or global levels in that way? Well, that's a really good question. And that's something that I think everyone has been trying to figure out. Um, for, for for a really long time, um, and I you know I, I when we talk about options for state finance, I mean I I'm not an expert in in financing, and so I think the best thing that I can say is is advocating, and that's and I think in advocating means showing people how addressing mental health, how expanding access to um, mental health. I think meets their needs too, right? So this is not this is in the interest of the mental health community that's very interested in these things. It's in the but how does it how is this relevant to other stakeholders, right? So I think part of part of what we spend a lot of time doing, I feel like the mental health in advocating, is 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 showing people why this is real, why this is relevant to you. Why is it relevant to people in HIV to pay attention to depression? Well, because we know that people who are depressed there's higher mortality associated with HIV, there's less adherence to care. So it's important to figure out how you integrate care for mental health into HIV. And I, and in, in a small way, you know, working with the various constituencies and the donors that are <laughs> responsible for those areas is one way of advocating, right? So there has been a, 
a lot of advocacy to PEPFAR. There's been advocacy to Gavi about why mental health needs to be integrated into HIV and TB care because there's a, you know, there, there's a, there's a very clear relationship with, with medical outcomes and with life, with lifespan, with longevity when we, when we don't address these issues. So I think we have to think about that. Um, we have to do the same thing more broadly, right? As to say, well, why does our population need mental health? Even if they're, they're not living with HIV, what are, the, what are the benefits to individuals, but also the benefit to our society if we invest in these areas? What's the benefit to education? What's the benefit to other sectors? That may be one way to argue for financing. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, it's interesting how, you know, when we think about negotiation principles, like coming up with mutual benefits, but, but that is a really critical way that we need to consider our advocacy efforts at each of these levels in terms of why, why there is mutual significance in trying to move mental health outcomes forward, even beyond what you'd think. There's actually another question, um, uh, which maybe it would make sense to, to think about kind of related to the integration of mental health with outcomes for other chronic diseases. So um, someone has asked, you know, said it was delighted to hear you speak about the integration of mental health with other chronic disease care globally. What is your take on behavioral health and lifestyle change, for example, around physical exercise and substance use as areas of overlap or synergy? I think you could take that however broadly or narrowly you you didn't want, but can you actually? Can you just say the last? What is the take on so, you... on behavioral health and lifestyle change as an area of overlap or synergy? When we, I think, when in the context of thinking about chronic disease care. Yeah, I, you know, I think exercise is like the magical intervention. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, it, it, it seems like you kind of can't go wrong by adding by adding exercise to whatever else you are encouraging people to do. So mm -hmm. I certainly do think that there is a there is a role to when we think about you know one I think one of the things that I didn't talk about is mental health promotion. So I would say that exercise is a form of mental health promotion, right? Mm -hmm. We know that good exercise exercise is good for our brains. We know that. Eating well is good for our brains. We know that ensuring that we get a good night's sleep <laughs> is good for our brain. And these are all things that we we put under the umbrella of lifestyle, even though I always feel like lifestyle makes it seem less important for some reason. Yeah. Talking, <laughs> like, but critical I, life elements or something. <laughs> I don't know what the best word is. But I but I do think that those are areas of mental health promotion. And so I would say that absolutely. Um, encouraging physical exercise, encouraging healthy diets, all of that is an important part of the integration around mental health and managing chronic diseases, definitely. Terrific. Well, we're, we are reaching the end of our hour here. I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to you know, have any final words <laughs> as we kind of think about mental health moving forward, whether it's what's giving you hope as you look at this or where you think our efforts and, and advocacy are best positioned, but happy to give you the, the last word as we conclude our time together. Yeah, I, I would say that I think that one of the most important consequences of the pandemic and this conversation we were just having about this global experience, or maybe I should say this universal experience um, during the pandemic of distress at mm -hmm. some point, is that it's a reminder that we experience similar phenomena, no matter who we are, mm -hmm. no matter our cultural contexts, uh, no matter where we live in the world, and that we need to remember that, that um, we're not talking about, when we talk about mental health in communities around the world, we're not talking about something qualitatively different. We're talking about human experiences. When we think about solutions, about what people need, they have to be relevant to people's experiences and understanding, but we have to remember the centrality of our shared humanity as a part of how we, how we respond. Um, I think that's what I hope people recognize through this pandemic that it can, uh, in some ways help simplify the way that we think about mental health, but I think also personalize the way in which we understand how people need to be 
responded to in different contexts because all of us have experienced some of these challenges during this time. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. I've really, really appreciated it. And um, we hope, of course, that you'll join us again someday for a discussion, but truly, thank you so much. Um, we will, um, to everyone gathered with us, thank you for taking the time with us today as well. We will uh, post the recording from this session, so feel free to view it later or to suggest it to friends or colleagues who might be interested. Um, and we will convene in another uh, month with our next webinar series. But thank you again, Dr. Collins. This has really been terrific. Take care. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.